So, Dr. Moran, welcome to the show. And we are very excited to have you with us. Uh, Michael, one of the coaches here at the Art of Charm, is a big proponent with ACT, and he has turned AJ and myself onto it. And we, and we have integrated some of the concepts into our, into our own training programs. So to give our audience uh, an overview of ACT, would you mind setting it up for us? Sure, happy to. And uh, I'm really honored to be here. So thanks for the opportunity. Acceptance commitment therapy is something I've been interested in since 1994. Um, it was developed by a whole group of individuals, um, most notably Stephen Hayes and Kelly Wilson and Kirk Strozal, but there was a whole bunch of folks who were interested in this. And it comes from the natural science of human behavior comes from something we might call behavior analysis. Behavior analysis is something that B.F. Skinner uh, created, developed, and essentially acceptance and commitment therapy is a blending of evidence-based approaches that embrace things like mindfulness, but also embrace empirically supported behavior change protocols and it encourages people to build up their psychological flexibility, which we'll talk about in a little while, rather than just going after a reduction of their own symptoms. What ACT does basically is it invites people to be willing to follow through on what's important to them during their finite period of time on this planet, even when it sometimes becomes painful or difficult to do so. You only have one opportunity to have a life well lived and acceptance and commitment therapy helps you become guided by scientific principles and applications to make that life meaningful. Now, we are huge proponents of behavior change, but we also know it's very difficult and we'd love to walk through what are the biggest things that get in the way of behavior change and then how does ACT address them? Right. Well, I think the things that impede behavior change, oftentimes it has to do with what we tell ourselves. It has to do with our language that we're taught and we learn very fluently early in life. And this language is extremely helpful. Our language helps us describe and evaluate the world around us and how to problem solve. How do we get more good things in our world? How do we prevent having bad things in our world? And are we, we language, we talk, we communicate with other individuals. And that's helpful, but it becomes so helpful to us to use language. It becomes so fluent that we talk certain ways that sometimes we get hooked by our language. Sometimes the things that we want to commit to, that we find important and meaningful, can sometimes be thwarted by the things we tell ourselves. We might tell ourselves things like, I am not that good at being assertive. I am a weak person or I am too shy. So we don't go after certain things that are important to us because of our self labels. We start to also use language to think about how things are going to be so much better in the future or things were so much better in the past. And that language about the, the, the future and the past becomes so governing of our present moment that we miss out on opportunities thanks to language because it's imagining a future, it's reminiscing about a past, and we miss the opportunities in the present moment. Sometimes we also use language to tell ourselves that some things that we feel are negative and not worth having. We tell ourselves, because we learned it from other people in our culture that use language, that certain ways of feeling are negative. We have a term called negative emotions. Like I will ask my boss for a raise when I am less anxious because anxiety is a negative emotion. Or I will ask this person out on a date when I, I'm not feeling so nervous or sad or depressed. I have to take these things that I'm feeling and change them rather than just have them. 
And we learn this rule of controlling our emotions early in life. And all of that stuff is, is that hook from language that we get taught to think certain ways about ourselves. And I don't think that's all that helpful. And there are other ways that language impedes committed action, but I'm wondering if there are any particular questions about what I just said that we should explore a little bit further. Yeah. Well, for myself, I've, I've learned to view thoughts, emotions, and language as a, a ball of yarn that has been thrown on the floor. It's all tangled up. And because it's all tangled up, you can't look at it straightened out and see how, it's a, how each one affects the other. And because it's all jumbled up, uh, it's, it's a mess, it's difficult, and it's very sticky, and it, and, and it makes your view, your lens of everything, more distorted. Of For myself, when I had learned that, or at least saw it in that metaphor, I've been, and I still do this to this time, I, Spend time in, in mindfulness, which is an opportunity to, to look at and begin to detangle, but also other opportunities to look at thoughts, look at emotions, look at words, it's, it's like writing and journaling and being. And any time that there is an opportunity to separate those things or to, to, to straighten them out, it's, it, you can start to see how they interact with each other a little bit more clearly. And then you can start to take actions towards dealing with them properly so that you're just not throwing stuff at the wall, trying to get unstuck, which seems to only make you more stuck. Yeah. I'm even going to jump off some of the things that you just said, Johnny. And that's like, there's a drive or proclivity an attempt, a desire to, as you said, straighten them out, right? Or in some way, like figure them out and deal with them in a particularly appropriate way. But I think you've used the phrase straighten them out as if the human condition were to be straightened out, right? That, that ball of yarn that's all over the floor, that is life it <laughs> is messy and to straighten that out is because we've learned from culture and parents and clergymen and teachers and culture that there is a straight path and it's supposed to go a specific way and oh my gosh what an abuse of language to like give someone that kind of indication that life is supposed to follow something that parallels an ideal, that it's supposed to be straight. We can't straighten it out. We can have the ball of mess. You can <laughs> just have it. And I think that's what we're after, at least that's my viewpoint. I'm not saying it's the right viewpoint, but I think that might speak to an act consistent viewpoint. We might not be able to straighten it out to fit a narrow path, but goodness gracious, I hope I never conform to a narrow path. Perhaps it's to look at it in that, in that mess and, and to be okay with it being yeah. that mess, but at least look at where each part is intersecting with the other and how it might af af affect those parts that it's intersecting with. And perhaps you, we were able with these methods in act uh, to look at them separately and to look at, see where they are intersecting and seeing how that intersection affects us. Johnny, what you're saying right there is like, we have to be okay with the mess. If, if I weren't okay with the mess of me, I would never be okay with me, right? And, yeah. and we have to like try to see if we can encourage people to break that cultural training and conditioning that everything has to be straightened out. I agree. What if, what if it weren't even judged to be a mess? It's chaotic. My life's chaotic. Sure, of course it is. It's dynamic and I've got relationships and I've got emotions and I've got thoughts and proclivities and genetic influences. <laughs> yeah. So of course it's chaotic, but it isn't a mess. Like that's judgmentalism. And when Kabat-Zinn defines mindfulness as paying attention to the present moment 
purposefully and non-judgmentally, I think that's where mindfulness comes in, Johnny. It's like that, like that mess. <laughs> it's almost, and with all due respect, like, like that mess, it makes me feel like I have to clean it up and straighten it right. out. But I don't want to. Like, I don't want to anymore. It's, it's the trying to get on the straight and narrow and clean things up in my life that have made a mess of it. And I think that's the true way to think about my clients too. It's their attempt to conform, to fit in, to have that normality that I'm supposed to have that leads to the problems. I agree. Obviously, that comes with the acceptance part, right? Accepting all of it, the total experience, the totality, not just seeking the pleasure or seeking the emotions that you label as positive or society labels as positive. And then the second piece is the commitment piece. And I think many people struggle with that because they don't have the internal handled. They focus on the external. And we've all heard the carrot and the stick and, and trying to set these big lofty goals, but the commitment piece has to come internally for you to actually follow through. And in that struggle that we're talking about to, to actually change our behaviors, right? We're, we're wired and, and habitually building these patterns that become hard to break. Well, many of us, we instead of focusing on our values, we look at, well, what's the payoff? What's the external reward? How are other people going to view me? Instead of, well, what do I actually need inside of me? And what are my driving forces that I could commit to and take action in that commitment? So how do we get there? If, if you're listening to the show and, and you find yourself falling into that trap where you have these great goals, whether it's the New Year's resolution or some big event in your life that's coming up, and we focus so much on the external and then we fall off and we can't keep taking that action that we know we need or building those new habits to change our behavior. I think the thing that keeps people committed is clarifying what's meaningful and purposeful in their life. And this goes back to the conversation I was having a few minutes ago related to language. What I was saying a little bit earlier is sometimes language can be an obstacle for us following through on what we care about, but sometimes not being clear with our language to figure out or to be able to describe what's meaningful in our lives. That is also an impediment to keeping a commitment. So I think one of the critical aspects of becoming more psychologically flexible, having a more meaningful life is being able to use language to declare and establish, this is what's meaningful to me. This is what I care about. It's personally relevant to me. It's vital. And I don't think we are given a lot of opportunities to do this clarification, what I prefer to call authorship, like to, to take some time in our lives and say, I'm only going to be on the planet for a finite period of time. It can be about lots of different things. And I can't control the things that happen to me. But how I react to the things that happened to me, it's somewhat under my influence when I can declare, this is what I stand for. Like, this is meaningful to me. I want to make my life, speaking just very personally, I want to make my life about rearing my children to live a full, abundant, flexible, healthy life. That's my family value. I care about reducing suffering and improving quality of living on this planet, even if it's just in my community. That's my occupational values. The question is for all my clients, for anybody listening to us right now, like what's yours? What do you want your life to be about? Now, what you want your life to be about has probably been influenced by your culture and your subculture and your education and your parents and your guardians. And I get that. But at some point you really get to freely choose that. You, you do, you get to say, this is what I care about in my life. And, you don't, a good act therapist or one doing it by themselves, a psychologically flexible person says, I'm not going to let expectations from my culture have that kind of influence on what I do. I want to make my life about 
creativity and making the world more beautiful and I care about aestheticism. So I'm going to, you know, not get a nine to five job and work in a cubicle. And I'm going to pick up a saxophone and get into an improvisational jazz trio. And I'm going to create art because I only have 40, 50 more years on this planet to do that. So what the heck? Why don't I do that? Why don't they do that? Why don't we do that? It's because we are in two ways governed. We're governed by our genetics to go after instant gratification. Like you gotta, you gotta make a paycheck so this way you can pay for your food. So you gotta do the thing that everybody else does. And then we're also governed by conditioning in our culture that says you gotta live your life this way. And we go, okay, Roger that. I gotta listen to what everybody else does. And we have to see and act, see if we can transcend that. Can we get beyond the instant proclivity to get reinforced, to get the next jolly like an animal? Like, can you put off instant gratification and say, I don't, I don't care about like instant gratification. I care about life's gratification. I care about, I care about this being vital to me because I'm only going to be here for a short period of time. And then, like seeing if you can notice that you have a culture teaching you to live life a certain way, but that might not be the way for you. And can you accept the anxiety with making that kind of choice and still commit to doing the thing that's meaningful? Well, I know in my life, it, taking that authorship view, I felt my dad was authoring my life through my high school experience and into college and, and even in my early adulthood career choices. And it was a struggle for me to take over that authorship. And I did. And it was against family's wishes and certainly my dad's definition of success. And it, it took a while for that relationship to heal because of some stubbornness on both sides. But I know when I share this story and I talk to our clients and, and our audience members, a lot of us are feeling that, that pressure, certainly from our parents. And you can understand it. They want us to be successful. They want us to be safe and they want us to achieve more than themselves. But that moment of taking over that authorship and saying, you know, this is me and these are my values is a very difficult time for young adults. If someone listening is experiencing that exact thing and, and trying to look for that deeper meaning in their life, you know, what would you tell them as they're facing this challenge? That's a good question because it would depend upon the relationship and my assessment of where they are in their life. But put that aside, I would try to highlight the reality of your going to eventually no longer have an influence on what you do because you've passed away. And people are going to eulogize you. People are gonna put a epitaph on your tombstone. And the question is to you now, as a youngster, what do you want it to say? You know, what do you want that epitaph to say that you conformed, that you were a good boy? you were a good girl because your mom and your dad told you to do it this way. You did. Good for you. Like, I don't know if I'd be that coercive or manipulative because we're kind of talking about this in shorthand, right? And if I care about my client I'm talking to, I might not be that much of a Weisenheimer. I'm also kind of a Weisenheimer and I'm like a New Yorker. My clients that I'm treating, if I assess that they are also a New Yorker, they might get it. They might get that I'm kind of playing that game that they fit in with. And I said, do you, do you, what, do you want that eulogizer when you're in the box someday and they're behind the pulpit? Do you want them to say they did their life just like the culture told them to? And we're here to honor that kind of lifestyle. And before I go any further, if that is the way someone chooses to live their life, if you come from a collectivistic kind of culture. Yes, I care about doing what my family wants me to do. There's no judgment there. I'm not being judgmental about this at all. 
Like this is sometimes what people choose to do with their lives. That's why I was somewhat reluctant to give you a hard and fast answer. It all depends on what the assessment is with my client. But sometimes the answer, excuse me, the intervention is more along the lines of, is this really what you want your life to be about? And it's just provocative. Like I don't want to change them. I don't want to shake up their whole entire world and have them leave a 45 minute session going, I'm going to completely negate everything anybody <laughs> ever taught me. And I'm never going to go to a Thanksgiving dinner and I'm not going to hold a nine to five and I don't care about a paycheck. And I don't know. Let's see if we can do something manageable with your resources and your skills and your connections and your environment. You made such a great point earlier that so many of us never take the time or have the space to even wrestle with these bigger questions <laughs> of what no. do I really value? What do I care about? And we feel adrift, whether that's culturally speaking of the influences or from our family's influences. And, you know, we talk a lot on the show about values and how important it is to understand them and tie them to your purpose. And then, of course, tie them to your goals so that you can find that motivation, that willpower that goes beyond the obstacles that are inevitably in front of you. And so many of our younger clients look at us sort of blankly around this idea of values and purpose because they don't even really know where to begin. Right. They've just fallen in line with the flow that is set out for them. And in that situation, it can feel entirely overwhelming of where do I start? How do I even pull this thread? Just to add to that, for myself as a younger person, and you had brought up this idea of, um, I believe is mental uh, flexity. Yeah, psychological flexibility. Psychological flexibility. I know that in my past, certainly most of my problems had stemmed from not being psych, not having that psychological flexibility right. and trying to force what was going on into some sort of pattern that I had learned or I had picked up that had worked in the past, but certainly doesn't fit this particular situation. But because I, my only experience is from a previous pattern I'm going to make this pattern fit and I'm going to make my emotions and my thoughts work with this. Yeah. And, and I'm going to be stubborn about it because, because that's what I have. And, and of course, as, as you know, the harder you try to do that, the worse the, the situation gets. Right. And I certainly had to learn to be okay with so many different things that were going on around me because I know that if I tried to do what I had always done in the past, it's, it's going to go wildly sideways. Right. Right. <laughs> if you always do what you've always done, you'll always going to get what you've always got. Right. I think that was Mark Twain. Like, and, and so we try to fit what used to work into a new environment because it was rewarding to do it the way it was done in the past and you got the pats on the back and the gold stars and you might have even gotten the instant gratification and satisfaction yourself but change is the only constant well that's a pre-socratic philosophical idea right there and we don't necessarily always remember that like the things are going to change in what used to work in the past i hope it works for you again it probably won't forever, you know? So that's the whole idea of psychological flexibility. It's, it's the ability to follow through on what you care about, even in the presence of obstacles. It's doing things that are meaningful, even when it's hard. It starts with just a simple why. Understand the goal, understand what you want to achieve, but you need to answer the question why. And if the why is to please someone else or it's coming externally, you're not going to find the motivation, the willpower, the discipline needed to achieve the behavior change that you're after. The why is so important. What, what is meaningful about this? Why are you doing this particular behavior? When we become super nerdy behavior analysts, it's kind of like a geeky way to look at human behavior. We're still always asking the question, why? What are the things that come after this behavior? that make you want to do that behavior again or never do it again? Like, what are the consequences? Why are you going to do this again? Why are you not going to do this again? What's the purpose of this behavior? 
to be able to ask yourself these questions, and as AJ mentioned earlier, a lot of us, we ask one or two questions on the surface, uh, and, and it's usually wrapped in a lot of what you were mentioning. Certainly, there's going to be a genetic answer. There's going to be a cultural answer. There's going to be a hedonic, what do I need right now to feel good answer. But, you know, it's slightly behind those answers are where more thoughtful, more caring, more value-driven answers lie. And so <clears throat> how can we help our audience continue to go down that path to find out where the answers that they need to bring in more purpose into their life and waking up to, to the values and that, that, that new narrative that's going to make life more purposeful for them? That's the catch, right? <laughs> In the 21st century, we are, are post-enlightenment. We are, what I mean to say by that, we've gone beyond getting our purpose told to us. Prior to our purpose being told to us, our purpose was just to mate, <laughs> you know, yeah. eat and mate and raise your children to carry that on. And then there was a lot of religious dictates that told us what our purpose was. And that wasn't fitting anymore. And sometime around the enlightenment, we started to really embrace science and now we're way further on in the 21st century. And we're going to say, maybe it's just more than this. What can be observed science? We can see if we can see this blending between what's scientific and what's also spiritual, not necessarily religious, but what I'm talking about is like, what could the purpose of your life be without relying on science telling you what it should be? And then that puts the youth now who deserve this kind of coaching. What can you make your life be about if it could be about anything pro-social to make sure that you do help out human beings, whether it's about procreating or not. It's just like, how do you contribute to a community it's well lived by everybody that you can be pro social about it, that you don't have to conform to certain types of governmental or religious rules, but you can still be pro social because it's meaningful to you. And then you get to figure it out. And we're not only going to say, accept the fact that you're going to fail and that's going to hurt. But what we want to do is create a community that also accepts the fact that you are going to fail and go do things and mess them up and fall down <laughs> and then stand up again. And then what we hope to do is build a community that doesn't just say the old Japanese proverb, proverb fall seven times, stand up eight. It's we're all going to fall down several times. Let's help up everyone even more than several times. Like, let's work together at that. Fall down seven times during those eight times that you stand back up, rely on other people because we're all in this together. We all swim in the same soup. Don't make it all about like, I have to conform. What if it could be about how you can commune, how you can be part of something and when you try to commune, when you try to be part of a community, you're going to make your mistakes. Of course you are. Everybody in their teens and 20s does the goofy stuff and it doesn't carry on. Thank goodness I'm not living the life that I thought I was going to lead when I was 20 years old. But I'm proud I had those 20s and I had those mistakes. And it wouldn't have, I wouldn't be where I am today without the mistakes. I don't think there's many of us who would want to take those times back or we, we those mistakes have certainly brought us to to where we are and then of course you know and all the advancements of science has certainly unchained us to certain ideas of who we are supposed to be but yet the science also points out that you can't get any more fulfillment and satisfaction in your own life than serving your fellow man there you go right 
and then I'm going to put that back on the marquee. You can't get anything more meaningful than serving your community. That's important. But then also a corollary to that is that you'll grow from pain. I mean, there's so much in spiritual literature, it doesn't matter what religion you're looking at, is that not only do you help other people contribute to society and to community, that it's also going to hurt sometimes. And that pain is where the growth comes from. And, and the connection. Yeah. There you go. That's it. it. Unifies us. Yeah. No matter what your station in life is, there will be pain. It doesn't matter if you're at the high end of the stratosphere in terms of success or the low end, there will still be pain and it is completely relative. I think, you know, jumping into the mindful action plan because it's such a powerful tool and we're going to link it up, theartofcharm.com slash map, check it out. It's fantastic. And really that, that first piece of I am, you touched on this earlier. So many of us hold on to these labels and these labels are passed down through previous actions. So something in our past that we got a negative response to that was tied to shame, embarrassment, and, and then we label ourselves and that creates this limiting belief around what we're capable of. So we have to first notice if we're, we're actually being held back by these unhelpful self descriptors. And that is the start of us starting to let go and, and get more present moment awareness of who I am right now today, and then take that next step of what matters. So walk us through this mindful action plan and, and how we can use it in our lives. Because um, one, Johnny and I absolutely love the tool and it distills it's down great. so many of the concepts that we've covered on the podcast in disparate episodes. So it'd be really helpful for our audience. Yeah. AJ, I appreciate you bringing up the, the I am piece first, and then that there's a whole mindful action plan. So the mindful action plan comes from acceptance and commitment therapy. And I was asked by clients that I was coaching, can you take this acceptance and commitment therapy and just put it into a form or a checklist? And it seemed a little strange because I'm like, well, we're about psychological flexibility and living a life in you know, a meaningful, <laughs> flexible way. And you want a checklist. But I wanted to use a flexible checklist. Well, I want to add to that, though. You're also behavioral analysis and also looking at past behaviors of seeing how they're going to affect with future behaviors. So there is some predictive abilities which are going to need to be able to be to be seen and, and looked at. So you yeah. cannot get away with that uh, psychological flexibility and this nebulous thing too much. I'm going to hold you there. Good point, Johnny. That's cool. <laughs> So what, what I wanted to hammer home in this checklist that I was coming up uh, to, my, to my coaching clients is that acceptance commitment therapy has six components. I'm not even gonna go into them right now. And I took those six components and I just colloquialized them. What I mean by that is I made them simpler to understand and I turned it into a sentence. I, I'm inviting people with the mindful action plan to be able to say, I am here now, accepting the way I feel, noticing my thoughts while doing what I care about. So there are six components there and it's right there on the mindful action plan checklist that you can find on the internet. And so those are the six components. The first one that AJ started to allude to is the I am. All of us human beings that are good at using language that don't have any language impairments, we have an ability to describe what our self is. And sometimes this self gets described in ways that makes us less flexible, less successful, if you will. We say things like, I'm a piece of crud. I'm no good. I'm depressed. I'm obsessive compulsive. You know, I'm you know, worthless. And we get taught that. Like that language is stuff that you have learned from psychiatrists or teachers or parents or subcultures. And I, I want to point out, it, it doesn't even have to be that, that negative. No. I'm okay. shy is one we hear all the Great. time. 
Great. And is used as an excuse, right? So the, the ultra negative ones we understand, that's lose or think it's going to impact you. But we often self-label with much softer terms that we don't realize limit us. Yeah, yeah, good points. And then if, if I may, just a little bit further, we can Please. even go positive with it, you know? Like, I'm a board certified behavior analyst. I'm not going to go hang out with my girlfriend and listen to a psychic during our second date. Together. <laughs> it's like, what? Like you just blew it, man. You got to be a little more psychologically flexible just because you think you're a <laughs> oh, big shot board certified behavior analyst doesn't mean you can't go to cool things. You know, I'm good. I, I, I I'm already a good snowboarder. I'm not going to try surfing because I might not be good at that. Like you've just reduced your, your, your psychological flexibility and, and fun things you could do in your life because you're saying good things about yourself. You know, so you're hundred percent right, AJ. Sometimes we say things to ourselves that could be subclinical, super clinical. They could be really good and they still impair us because here's the thing. You're not any of that stuff. There's certainly utility in those little brackets and those labeling, but there, but that utility is also limited. Yeah. Oh, oh, giant. Don't get me wrong. Like I, I don't ever want to say I'm <laughs> not certain things in my life. Like right. when I say I am a dad, you know, like, but, but at the same time, I might say I am a psychologist because that helps me get paid by a third party payer. You know, when I treat, I am a psychologist. That's what I am. That's, that's what I do. There is a, a main point here is that at the core of every, I'm a psychologist, I am shy, I am a snowboarder, I am dad. There's, there's a point to that. And it's there all the time. And that is, I am. Mm -hmm. That's it. And that's a hard thing to get across during an interview and in therapy and in coaching. It's something that needs to be experienced. You exist. You are. You are not the roles you play, the emotions you feel, the sensations you have, the body you experience. You're not those things. You have those things, but they're not you. There is a core you, an observing self that has been you your whole entire life. That's unbroken, unchanged, unfractionated by all of the experiences you've ever had, no matter how you can label yourself, you will always be I. You just are you. It's hard to language about it. It's more of an experiential exercise. It's more of an experience to get to it. Like it's just that deep breath, the exhale and noticing that you were the one that exhaled and inhaled that you just exist and you're not the stuff you tell yourself you are. That's important to just be able to say, I am. But then we go beyond that with the mindful action plan. I am not, I am a psychologist, not I am a father, not I am depressed, not I am shy. I just am. I am here now coming in contact with time and place, mindfully noticing what's up with that I am right here and right now. I'm not going to get caught up with there and then in the future or there and then in the past. I am here now. This is a profound thing for someone to say. It's not like poetic, but it is profound to be able to say, I am here now to be entirely centered on your existence and where it is and when it is. So many of us are distracted and unable to put our attention on the here and now. And I think that's really an important part of this plan is, yeah, there are other ways that we can put our attention and focus to avoid the discomfort, to avoid dealing with the tangled ball of string that Johnny described. But when we center our focus in a mindful way on actually what's happening in front of us, we can then start the next step, which is notice, right? You can't notice if you are distracted, if you're playing the PS5 and your social media is up and you got your browser, you got seven things going on. You can't possibly then get to the next step, which is start accepting what's actually going on in your life. Right. AJ, you're uh, right on the money there. And both of the things that we're going to go on next is I am here now accepting the way I feel <laughs> and noticing my thoughts.
because we have been taught to not accept the way we feel. We've been taught, don't worry, be happy. You know, they're there, don't cry. Or if you keep crying, I'll give you something to cry about. Like we get this message early on in our life that you shouldn't just accept or be willing to feel the way you feel. You have to feel happy. And when you chase happiness all the time and try to avoid the other natural emotions that show up, actually what it does is it makes those other natural emotions worse, if you will. It makes them tenacious. It makes them more intense. You know, when, for instance, when someone says, I want to avoid that party because I am shy, getting away from the I am stuff, but the non-acceptance of the fact that their heart is pounding and their limbs are shaking and their butt is sweating. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to go because I, I'm feeling anxiety and anxiety is a negative emotion. When they don't accept the fact that they feel that way, they never put themselves in the opportunity to shake people's hands, look them in the eye and use their social skills. And if you don't do that, you'll never get good at those social skills. And you know what happens then? You're always afraid to meet new people. But then I'm going to go one more step beyond that and say you also don't, and this is a nerdy psychology term, but you don't counter condition your anxiety. You don't face it. Let your heart pound and your limbs shake and your butt sweat and do it over and over and again. Eventually, that, that stuff drops off but you got to put yourself in the fear provoking situation in order for you to counter condition that you like put yourself in the face of discomfort so that you're comfortable with it. But then I'm going to go. Yeah. May I just once more step, Johnny, I, I'm sorry. To interrupt. But then one more step beyond that, not only are you learning social skills, counter conditioning the anxiety, you're going to parties now. Like that's more important than learning social skills and counter conditioning anxiety. You're having a life, but it doesn't happen if you're non accepting of the natural emotions, not negative emotions, natural emotions. Sorry, I interrupted you, John. Oh, no, not on fact. Your point was, is, was eloquently put. Uh, I just wanted to add it as I've gotten older. And I think for a lot of us, when we get older, we, we start to realize how we learn. We start to realize how, how our emotions play out. I, I call it uh, emotional theater, where there's, there, there has to go through this set. Uh, and, and you can't shortcut it. You just have to let it run its course. You can step back. You can observe it. You can laugh at it. You can mock it. You can have fun with it, but you cannot do anything to stop it. And with that, f having a growth mindset, I have to always throw myself into things, knowing that it's going to be a mess. It's going to be, and, and once I create that mess, then I'm going to go through the, um, the emotional theater of everything comes with yelling at myself, beating myself up, laughing at what's going on, the whole thing. And then... It's finally I could start picking up the pieces of the mess I made, slowly begin to work my way through, start learning, start to feel better that, oh, hey, now I have a grasp of what is going on. And now all of a sudden I start to get happy that I can find my way through. And then boom, now it's, hey, I know how to do that. I went through the, the effort and the painstaking work to do that. And now I'm going to teach somebody else how to do that. And I'm going to mentor them. Yeah. Um, having people begin to do that mentorship, I think, is an important component. Like you've, you've been through it. Help other people through it also sounds like a, a good idea. I mean, the way you just described it, Johnny, I mean, it, it sounds to me like a life well lived in a growth mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Frustrating, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I, I want to touch on that counter conditioning because it, it it's counterintuitive. Yep. Quite honestly, because the initial pain of anything we do the first time, the second time, the third time, that discomfort and anxiety around the unknown, the uncertainty, and and it's not a pattern that we're used to. So therefore, our mind is going to go in all these different directions. But exactly your point. Over time it will diminish, but it never goes away entirely. So 
we find that a lot of clients come with unreal expectations of, you know, I just never want to feel anxious again. I just always want to feel confident. And that also sets us up for failure because that unreal expectation that your body's not going to have a physical response to something that's new that maybe you've experienced before, but let's be honest, the social environment that we're talking about, it's not a controlled environment. It's other people interacting. So it's always going to be there. So we don't want to set the target or the goal on, I want to overcome it and never feel that way again. I don't, I just want to go through it just a few times and then it's gone for good. But realize that that anxiety is coming from a good place, a place of growth and a signal that, hey, there, there's lessons to be learned and the pursuit of my good life is through that. It's not try to turn it down as fast as possible, find the hack, find the shortcut, reshape our mind to avoid it in other ways, but it, realize that anxiety will wane. It will never be as high as the first time or the second time or the third time, but there's no reason that you shouldn't keep feeling it because if you're feeling it, you're growing. You're in a place where you are expanding that life worth living. It's making me think of a couple of things and the way you're talking about is right on from an act consistent perspective. Um, the first thing I'm responding to or reacting to is that you're saying some people want to always feel confident, but if you actually take the term confident and break it, break it apart, it's con fides, right? So con, like chili con carne, it's, you know, chili with meat. So the con means with, and then the fides or fidens is faith. Confidence is with faith. You don't know. You don't know. That's what confidence is. I don't know, and I'm going to do it anyway. Like, so, no, hey, like that idea, I want to feel confident. You just have faith that you're going to do it, but things can go horribly wrong, and you do it anyway, right? And then the other thing I'm responding to, and I'm just thinking about, you know, the fact that you might not be able to see it because um, I didn't light it up, but there's a snowboard, a skateboard, and a surfboard right behind me. This is my living room. This is what I do for fun. When you are doing any of those things, oftentimes when you feel like you're going to fall a certain direction, the worst thing to do is to overcompensate in the opposite direction. If I'm snowboarding and I'm leaning this way and I'm about to face plant into the mountain, do not go like this backwards because you'll catch an edge and then next thing you know, you hit your butt, you hit your head and you're doing a yard sale on the mountain with all your clothes everywhere. What you do is as you're falling this way, lean this way. Wait, I'm going to lean the way that I'm about to fall and where the fear is and where the pain might be. Yep. Yeah. Lean into it. Like, I mean that, like not psychologically. And right now we're talking about snowboarding, lean into it. And what happens is the snowboard goes down a little bit deeper in the snow. You bend your knees the right way. The snowboard bends a little bit and it like speeds you up. And because you've got more speed, you capitalize on the centripetal force, just like water in a bucket. When you spin it around, it doesn't fall out. Your body is like that water in a bucket. You lean the way it goes, and then you pick up speed. It's exhilarating. It's totally anxiety provoking. Oh my gosh, I'm going even faster in the direction that I might fall. You know what happens? You pick up so much speed, you don't fall. Skateboarding, snowboarding, snowboarding, and surfing, it's the same thing. And I think it's the same thing with life. Lean into the pain and the anxiety and the struggle and the shyness and just say, I'm willing to face this. And when that happens, you're totally open to outcomes. You're totally open to experience. And then that openness actually leads to a new way to process it. I love it. Sometimes you might not be mentally ready for it. And, and sometimes you just have to be willing to do it anyway. I'm not ready. I haven't figured it all out. I haven't been trained enough. My heart's still pounding. My limbs are still shaking. My butt is still sweating. And so I'm not, I'm not ready and I'm willing anyway. Yeah. 
I'm going to go in, but everything is not yeah. <laughs> prepared properly. <laughs> <laughs> so we were talking about like that mindful action plan. And we were talking about how we've got this I am experience and the here now experience. And then we're accepting our emotions and we're noticing our thoughts and we're being mindful of them too. And then the follow-up is I am here now accepting and noticing while doing what I care about. And we alluded to that, but I just want to round out what the mindful action plan is about. It's about doing some kind of overt, noticeable, measurable behavior. You're doing things. I mean, all of this act and mindfulness stuff is nonsense if you aren't doing some kind of behavioral change. So what are you going to do? And I hope it's being done because of what you care about. You know, find out what your values are. And we talked about it, but I just wanted to round that out. We talked about values and meaning and purpose and what your epitaph is going to say and what your eulogizer is going to talk about while you're in, in the box. I am here now accepting the way I feel, noticing my thoughts while doing behaviors that I care about or find meaningful in my life. And that word that's key for me is the while part because Yes, sometimes your emotions and who you are and the acceptance of it will be completely in line with doing what it is that you care about and want to do. And that's great, but we can't depend on that. So it's important to realize that there will be times when everything, you can call it flow state or whatever you want to call it, is in sync and acting in, in line with your values feels good and everything's great. But that wow part is acknowledging that there's a large chunk of time when you're not going to be feeling like it and it's yeah. going to feel painful and the anxiety is going to be there like we talked about and reminding yourself of that like a mantra, understanding that this is a part of the human condition is the important takeaway. AJ, what you're saying is like when you're following through on your values, it feels good. And then I'm glad you followed it up. And what you said wasn't explicitly like this, but you also said, and sometimes following through your values doesn't feel good. I mean, that's that's also what you said, and I just wanted to highlight that and really uh, clarify that, put a sharper point on it. You said that values sometimes doing that feels good, and then sometimes you got to do stuff, and and if you care about it, it doesn't necessarily feel good, and it's still what you value, you know, like not giving my kid his tuition money because he didn't work all summer and he just goofed off what am i supposed to like just give it to you like no it's student loan time and you got to pay that back i i can't i it doesn't feel good to tell my kids no but it's the right thing to do given the context so sometimes values-based behavior doesn't always feel good look like, let's just change it off of my son about something like that, because that was kind of a fictional right there. My son's really a very productive and contributing member of society. <laughs> but like, it doesn't feel good to wake up at 5 a.m. and uh, walk 10 minutes to the gym and crank it out on the elliptical trainer for 45 minutes every time. It doesn't feel good. But if you value health, if you value longevity, if that's meaningful to you, then sometimes those are the things that you have to do. Sometimes values-based behaviors are the lead to things that you have to accept rather than just sit back and enjoy. I think that's what makes them so powerful and why we, we connect to other people who share in those values because we know that if they're not doing the easy thing, if they're if they're going to submit to these values that they have chosen for themselves to, to, to do the hard things, well, then we know that how much they cherish those values. And if you're cherishing the things that I'm cherishing, well, n now I can have, I can put my faith and not only in my values, but in you. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's right on the money, right? That's, that's relationship building. That's, that is, authenticity um that's intimacy you know um that's cool yeah to be able to have that shared values is really important but it starts with us we have to clarify those values all right and that's why this week's challenge we highly recommend you go through the mindful action plan with intention and focus on who you are now what it is you're feeling in the present moment and then defining what are the things you want to be doing in line with those values now, we love 
wrapping every episode with a question about you and and what you believe your X factor is, what you bring to the table that makes you unique and successful. Oh, wow. I didn't prepare this one. Um, I guess that I am um, reverently irreverent. I really care about science. I care about my community. I care about people I help but I'm always going to do it like a complete and utter wise ass because I don't think if you take it too seriously, you're going to be as impactful. So I'm surrounded by faculty members, fellow consultants and an act community that lives their life a particular way and looks at things a certain way. I agree with uh, many of them on their values and their approaches and their applications but I just want to do it in a fun and irreverent kind of wise guy way. I think that's what helps me work with the folks that I work with. You know, I mean, I, I work in safety. I work in blue collar situations. I work with, um, for lack of a better term, like a low SES clientele, um, uh, folks who probably aren't going to walk around their workplace and say like, namaste to all of their fellow workers but at the same time i want to have taught them about situational awareness which is actually mindfulness but don't tell them that you know like i just i kind of want to just be a regular dude who knows this stuff pretty well and see if i can apply it to everybody you know, I think there is something about a blue collar sense of humor that comes to your values. What's important, because you have to figure out what those are if you're going to do this drudgery work. And when I say that, my, my dad worked in a factory for much of my my upbringing. And as much as he hated going into that job, there was a reason that he did it to provide for the family, what the job meant to him, the the, the how he uh, build it into his mind as contributing to society. And when you, there, there is a humor that comes out of having to do things that you do not want to be doing. And I think that it is a very blue collar sense of humor that has always attracted me. And I think that's, that's, you you see that same sense of humor. I know AJ gets it. That's probably how we've been laughing and working together for 15 years. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just it's it's uh, the culture I'm from. So I just want to uh, take everything that I've been blessed and privileged to be able to learn and experience and spread it around to uh, folks not who might not have contact with this kind of stuff on a regular basis. And we value that immensely. And thank you for sharing with our audience. AJ and Johnny, this was a lot of fun. I really appreciate talking to you folks. You're adding a lot of really great content to oh, the internet you. and for folks. Uh, you've got a, a great show. And um, I'm stoked to be a part of it. This is really rad. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, guys. Be free.